Well, so like Jeff said, it's New Year's Eve 2017, and tonight when the clock strikes midnight, the whole world will roll from 2017 into 2018. It's kind of hard to believe. And even as we sit here, throngs of people are gathering to celebrate in Times Square in New York City, even as they have done since about 1907. And by 9 o'clock this evening, thereabouts, over 1 million people will be jammed into just a few city blocks there in New York City. Now that looks like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> a million people braving the cold and the crowds just to watch that famous ball drop to mark the end of one year and the beginning of another year. And the moment that ball drops, which by the way is 12 feet in diameter and weighs over 12, just about 12,000 pounds, the moment that ball drops, uh, when the clock hits midnight, some 3,000 pounds of confetti, that's 30 million pieces of paper, will be dropped by hand over Times Square. Fun, right? How many of you have ever done, how many have done that in Times Square? Everybody been to Times Square? Okay, I've not been there, but I hope I have this next part right. Here's the not fun part about Times Square. To get your spot in the crowd so you can see that ball drop, you have to get there early. Some started getting there last night, some are getting there right now. And you gotta, you're going to be there like nine, ten hours early waiting. And do you know how many public restrooms there are for a million people in Times Square? None. Zero. Zero porta potties for a million people. Uh, so what they do is they sell adult diapers for a pack of 20, 17 bucks. And so you hope that makes you, gets you through the day. There are also no food vendors, so you can't buy food when you're there. Uh, you can pay $350 a seat at Applebee's if you want to sit there for the whole celebration. That's the not fun part. And for those of us who just aren't able to be there in person, uh, it's estimated that 100 million of us Americans will watch on TV. How many will watch at least part of it on TV tonight? Okay, I'll watch just part of it. Did you know that 22% of us will be asleep by the time midnight comes, and that probably will be me as well. Here's a question. Why do we celebrate New Year's Eve? Why do we do the things we do? I did a little research, found out that historians believe that even though ancient cultures all follow different calendars, sometimes wildly different calendars, human beings have celebrated what they believe to be the beginning of a new year consistently since about 4,000 years ago. Uh, it was Julius Caesar, actually, in 46 B.C., who determined that January 1st would be the beginning of a new year. He aligned the Roman calendar with the sun, and so he added the month January that didn't exist before, and he named it after the pagan god Janus, who was the god of time, the god of new beginnings. It's interesting that, that Janus, that pagan god, was depicted as having two faces, one facing backward in time and one facing forward in time. The point is that human beings have always celebrated with New Year celebrations. The question is why? I read an article online from Psychology Today where the author speculated that human beings have celebrated the coming of a new year throughout history for two main reasons. First, to celebrate survival, as in we're still here. Secondly, hope. Hope for good fortune, for good luck in the coming year. And all that kind of makes sense. It's, human beings are kind of wired up for hope. But here's the question for today. How does our faith shape how we think about and celebrate a new calendar year? I'm going to start with one of the oldest parts of the Bible today. In the book of Ecclesiastes, written, scholars believe, about 2,500 years ago. So listen to these words of Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain for all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. Verse 8, all things are wearisome. More than one can say, the eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear is full of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. Now, not exactly the most cheery passage of Scripture I could find. In fact, downright depressing in some ways. But the Bible here is simply saying that everywhere we look, we see something old. 
That's the first thing I want to talk about today, that is something old. Or as the teacher says, there is nothing new under the sun. A couple of weeks ago, in the middle of the build up to Christmas, uh, one of my sons came home from work one day, and I was already at home, and I noticed he was wearing one of my sweaters from my closet. I said, hey, nice sweater. And he said, yeah, it was ugly sweater today, today at work. <laughs> Now, is that really that ugly? That's a rhetorical question. You don't have to raise your hand, okay? When I got over the pain of his comment, I said, well, you just wait, you just wait, buddy. If I hold on to that sweater long enough, it's going to be back in style again. The teacher says, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. And that's true when you think about it. Consider fashion. Fashions do go out of style, and then they come back again. Consider eyeglasses. Here's a photo from a 1960s yearbook, two sharp-looking young dudes. And here's what eye fashion looks like today, 40, 50 years later. Not all that much different. Think about what men's suits looked like years ago. You recognize these guys? The Beatles from the early 1960s, and here's what men's fashion looks like today. What goes around comes around. There's nothing new under the sun. Two of my sons recently took a trip to Mexico, and we'll find out that history itself tends to repeat itself. They were visited uh, the ancient Mayan ruins in a place called Chichen Itza. Some of you may have been there if you visited, uh, uh, what's, what's, that, what's the resort down there? Anyway, there's a resort down there, Cancun. If you visit Cancun, you can go to see the Mayan ruins. At the center of the ruins is this pyramid, nearly 100 feet tall, a magnificent piece of of engineering, but just to the side of this pyramid is a large open field. Large open field, and many uh, anthropologists believe this field was used uh, as a kind of a playing field for an ancient kind of contest or game. It's surrounded by high walls on both sides, and they think it was a contest because way up on one of the walls, about 20 feet above the ground, there's a ring fixed to one of the walls. And they believed that these contests between warriors or whatever is held with a rubber ball, they would push and hit it back and forth. And if one of the teams got it through that ring, the game was over and they won. And then they sacrificed the winner to the gods. That's, that, that's what they think. Today, a thousand years later, we still play games with hoops and rubber balls. What goes around comes around. Look back over the events that dominated our news cycle in our culture over the past year. We see the same thing. None of it really new. Political strife, that's not a new thing. Natural disasters, violence, war, human evil, even the solar eclipse comes round and round every certain number of years. All things are wearisome, the Bible says, more than one can say. And what about people? What about us? Do people change over the centuries? Did you see the story that came out right before Christmas about the riot that happened in a Walmart as people started a fist fight over the last TV left in, a, in the TV section trying to buy it for Christmas? It happened. My wife and I were driving somewhere pre-Christmas, just, just maybe a few days before Christmas. You know, everybody's in a Christmas mood, being kind to each other, waving Merry Christmas, saying that to strangers. We're in traffic, and it was a backup, heavy traffic somewhere. We're having to merge onto a merge lane. You know, what you do there is you sort of alternate. That lane goes first, and you take your turn, and they go. And everybody's, been, you're waving and saying, Merry Christmas. You know, you go before me and all that stuff. So I let the guy go. He took his turn. And I was getting ready to take my turn. And the guy who was supposed to let me in never even looked at me. He just gunned it and beat me to the spot. I was like, hey, it's Christmas. <laughs> is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. The way we see this today is the more things change, the more they stay the same. The whole world is full of something old, the Bible says. But in the midst of all this old, we also see something new. It's the second thing we're going to talk about, something new. How many of you either gave or received new clothes for Christmas? That's yeah, fairly common. As our boys get older, we more and more tend to give clothes uh, at our house. But giving clothes for Christmas can be a little bit of a risky venture. I mean, you could get the wrong size. You could get something that your loved one doesn't really like that much. Uh, you can send an unintentional message. This is a medium. I wear a small. You know, what are you saying? Or you can do what I did a couple years ago. A couple years ago, I found this, I was kind of in a hurry. It's getting to Christmas time, and I kind of like to do my shopping then. So I go into this store, and I immediately see something that really looks nice for my wife. So I buy the whole set, the whole thing. 
have it put in boxes, all proud of myself, get home, wrap it up, put it on the tree. Christmas Day comes, she opens it. She acts reasonably happy when she gets it. And then after Christmas, she takes me up to her closet and she shows me something. And she shows me the exact same outfit hanging in her closet. I bought her the year before. <laughs> That's right. The exact same thing. Everything. Two years in a row. The whole point of giving clothes is to give something new. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul talks to us about what is new. He says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. The Apostle Paul says the old is passed away. The new has come. So how does Christ make us new? Little gospel review. The good news of the gospel is that Christ gives us four news. First, a new heart. We have new hearts because we are forgiven. In Colossians chapter 2, we read, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. I want you to see that little word, all. Three letters, A-L-L. A terribly important word. See, I think we often, without even thinking about it, sort of rewrite this scripture in our minds and hearts. We read, he forgave all our sins, but in our minds and hearts, we repeat it to ourselves like this. He forgives most of my sins. He forgives most of them, you know, except that one, that one there that I really can't forgive myself for. He forgives most, except for that one. He's going to get me for that one someday. I just know it. And we sort of hang on to them. Listen to me. Jesus didn't go to the cross. He didn't shed his blood. He didn't endure separation from his heavenly Father to make us mostly forgiven, to make us partly forgiven, to make us kind of forgiven. He forgives all, all our sin. We have new hearts. Because we have new hearts, we have new life. And therefore, we can afford to offer that same forgiveness to others. In Ephesians 4, we read, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. See, a new heart gives us the capacity to forgive others. You could say it this way. Our capacity to forgive others is directly related to our experience of Christ's forgiveness for us. In fact, I would say it this way. It's impossible for us to forgive others unless we've experienced the forgiveness of Christ in our own lives. It's impossible. We have new hearts. Secondly, we have new identity. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Jesus didn't come to make us nicer people. That's a byproduct, but that's not what he came to do. He didn't come to make us a better version of ourselves. That's a byproduct of what he came to do. What he came to do is make us new creations, to take spiritually dead people and make them alive again. Our culture is consumed with the issue of identity. The cultural message is you need to find your true self and then you need to be who you really are. So our culture pushes us to look deep into ourselves and find our own identity. So we desperately try to identify ourselves and anchor our identity in what we feel, in what we do. We try to find what makes us unique. But the problem is we can't. We can't anchor identity there because our feelings change. We can't anchor identity in what we do because there's always someone who does what we do better. We can't find it in our uniqueness because there's always someone a little more unique. In Romans 8, Paul says, The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. The Bible tells us that by faith we are adopted as children of God. 
Therefore, our identity is anchored not in what we feel about ourselves, not in what we can do, not in how unique we are, how unique we are not. Rather, identity is anchored in who loves us and who chose us as his children. When we rely on our culture to tell us who we are, we are slaves to fear, he says. When we allow our feelings to determine our identity, we are slaves again to fear. When we allow Jesus, who created us, who redeemed us, who shaped us in his image to tell us who we are, we are sons and daughters. The Bible says we have new identity. Thirdly, we have new purpose. In Ephesians chapter 2, we read, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, if you've been around Chapel Street for any length of time at all, you know we are constantly inviting you to find some place to serve to get involved in serving somewhere. Shepherd's Heart Care Center, Food Pantry, Buddy Break, Children's Student, Women's Ministry, Short-Term Missions, local serving opportunities in your own neighborhood. Find some way to serve. And then we do that not because we just want to run a bunch of programs, not because we want you to feel a little bit better about yourself by doing something nice for somebody else, but we do that because we believe that the gospel gives us new hearts, new identity, and new purpose. We do it because we want you to be who you already are. You've been given new purpose. And finally, fourthly, you've been given new destiny. New destiny. On Christmas Eve, I got a text somewhere in the middle of our 10 services that weekend, nine services on that day. I was driving back and forth between campuses, got a text on my phone. It was from the granddaughter of a man I had visited in his home uh, just a few, just maybe two weeks prior. I met a guy who's been attending our church for about 11 years, uh, struggling with cancer, dementia, all sorts of issues. And she was just letting me know via text that her grandfather had slipped into a coma and was very near death's door, just so I knew. Turned out he passed away the day after Christmas, and I'll be doing his service uh, here in a, in, a, in a week or so. And when I do that service, I'll be so glad to be able to share these words from 1 Peter chapter 1. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth, new birth, clean heart, new identity, new purpose, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. New destiny. This is why the gospel matters. Someday, maybe in 2018, maybe in 2019, maybe in 2038, every single one of us will be where that man was a few days ago, right at death's door. And at that moment, we're going to need to know what our destiny is. We're going to need to have hope. Hope in what? Hope in the flipping of a calendar year? What kind of hope is that? It's just hope in hope. But we have a hope in an eternal destiny because it's promised to us by the one who gives us new hearts, new purpose, new identity. One more thing, something old, something new, and now I want to ask you a question. What do you want? What do you want? We all know the New Year prompts many in our culture to sort of take stock, look back, take stock of your life and look ahead, and and often it takes the form of of resolutions, sort of promises to ourselves. Lose weight, get out of debt, quit smoking, spend more time with family. The top resolution of 2018, I saw this in some blog, is to be a better person. Pretty much sums it all up. What's interesting to me is I look at those lists every year. And the lists of resolutions in North America doesn't change very much from year to year. They all stay about the same, almost in the same order every year. What do we want? We all want kind of the same things. In Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes to us about what he wants. Listen to what he says. Verse 12, not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. 
Hear the identity there? Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let, all of, let those who, of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. It's one of my very favorite passages in the New Testament. First of all, because it's honest. This is the Apostle Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament himself through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm not there yet. I don't have it all together yet. It's honest. It's also active and dynamic, straining, pressing on. It's challenging, demands focus and effort, and I like that. It's also simple and clear. He says, one thing I do. There's only one thing on my list. It's actually one thing with two parts. The first part, he says, is forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting what lies behind. Have you ever heard of something called Good Riddance Day? I hadn't either, but it takes place in New York City, in Times Square, the third, uh, a couple days before New Year's. It took place this week on a Thursday, on December 28th. And it started a few years ago. Uh, it was kind of a marketing plan by a company that makes shredders, giant shredders. They pull a giant truck into Times Square full of shredders. And people then start showing up, bringing stuff they want to shred that symbolize things from the past year they want to let go of. Photographs of relationships that went sideways, uh, tax bills, memories they write on forms provided that they want to just get rid of, and they put them through a shredder. I think that's kind of what the Apostle Paul is talking about. He says, forgetting what lies behind. I think he means forgetting for himself the false anchor points that he once held on to as his identity. Paul, Paul the apostle was once Saul of Tarsus, proud, educated, powerful, enforcer of the law, supremely religious, and that was his identity. He says, shred it, shred it all. None of it is worth anything. I have new identity now in Christ himself. I think he means Forgetting past failures and sins and disappointments. Paul once was a persecutor of followers of Jesus. He stood by while Stephen was stoned to death, giving his approval. He says, all that, shred it, shred it up, because I have a new heart now. All that is forgiven. Forgetting what lies behind and straining toward what lies ahead, he says, I press on. Now, the language he uses here is borrowed from the world of athletics. It means to run after, to pursue, to earnestly desire. The images of a, of a runner in a race straining forward to hit the tape at the finish line with all his energy and all his passion. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What's that? What's he talking about? I think he means he's pressing on to become what Jesus has already made him to be. He's pressing on to become what Jesus has already made him to be because he knows Jesus has more for him, more love and more joy and more service and more life. And it's not back there. It's not back there in the past. That's shredded. It's out there in front of him. He's saying to us that Jesus has something more for you. More love and more joy and more service and more impact and more life. But it's not back there. In the old, it's out there. It's in the new, he says. A few years ago, <clears throat> on the occasion of his 50th birthday, uh, my brother Joe decided to do an Ironman triathlon with his son Jeremy. It's a midlife crisis, maybe a moment of temporary insanity, but he decided to do this triathlon. These are the big races. These are where you swim two miles in open water, bike 118 miles or 112 miles, and then run a full marathon, 26 miles at the end. It's an incredible thing to do. His son was a college athlete and was in good shape. So they trained for almost a year to get ready. They were going to do it together, swimming, biking, running, all that stuff. So the night before the event, which I think was in Louisville in August, it was really hot and all that, but there's a banquet before these events. 
And at the banquet, the dinner, they honor a whole bunch of different people. The last year's winner, you know, the world record holder in time, the youngest competitor, the oldest competitor. And then they gave an honor to the, the guy who had run, who had competed in the most triathlons. They brought him up front. He was like a 78-year-old man who had done like 50 of these. And my brother says he remembers seeing that guy walk up on stage thinking, wow, how in the world can a 78-year-old man do that many triathlons? How can he do it? It must take him forever to finish one of these things. Anyway, race day comes and he and his son do the swimming and the biking together. But when it came time for the run, which is the 26-mile marathon, they parted ways because his son was faster and he has an arthritic knee, so he had to kind of run, walk, jog, walk, jog, walk, jog, and it took him forever to finish the marathon. So fast forward almost six hours. It took him six hours to finish the marathon. He's 13 hours into the triathlon now. He can barely walk. He's 13 hours into it. He finally gets to where he can see the finish line. It's like 200 yards ahead. He can see it. He's almost there. Just hanging, he's surviving. And then he hears a sound from behind him. Somebody's catching, gaining ground on him, catching up to him. And he finally, the, the, sound, the person finally gets right next to him and he looks over and it's a 78-year-old man <laughs> who for 13 hours has been catching him <laughs> from behind. And my brother says, he could, he could barely walk, he said. He could see the finish line. He looks at that guy and he says, something snapped inside of him. And he just said, not today, buddy. And he <laughs> sprinted like the last 100 meters. And he beat him at the end, had a big hug, and they all laughed about it and all that. But I think that's what Paul's talking about. Forgetting what's behind, straining toward what is ahead. Keep your eyes focused that way, not behind. The old is gone, he says. The new has come. So he says, press on. Press on. Let me bow with me as I close today. Lord, we thank you today for your word. Thank you for reminding us that the more things seem to change around us, the more they really stay the same. But that's not where our hope is. Because the really new thing you want to do is in us, new hearts, new identity, new purpose, new destiny. Remind us that the new you want to do in our homes, in our neighborhoods, and even in the world, is through the new you do in us. So help us press on to what you have for us. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.